We have one presentation tonight, and that presentation is from Huntsville Utilities regarding recent winter weather impacts. Wes Kelly, the CEO uh, from Huntsville Utilities, is here, and he's brought a whole team with him, including a special <laughs> guest. Would you like to introduce them? Absolutely. Uh, it's my privilege. First, introduce myself. My name is Wes Kelly with Huntsville Utilities. It is always a privilege to visit the Huntsville City Council. Uh, along with me today by special guest is Mr. John Hand. John is the Executive Director of Electric Cities of Alabama. The Electric Cities of Alabama represents all municipal electric systems in the state of Alabama. So uh, we're happy to have John with us tonight. It's just coincidence. And, and he was here on a Thursday night. Where else would you be but at Huntsville City Council? We also have a... a Welcome. Vice President of Operations, Mike Counts, uh, in case the questions get rough. Uh, Mike is here to answer the tough ones. Uh, Vice President of Engineering, Stacy Cantrell, in case you want to uh, pin me down on what we're going to build in the future. And then uh, Vice President of Employee Engagement, Harry Hobbs. And then uh, Joe Gertis, our Director of Community Relations. Happy to have them with me. Welcome. We're glad you're here. All right. Well, uh, we have had an exciting event happen. Uh, uh, Santa Claus may have come to town, but so also did extreme weather. And so over uh, the event, uh, I want to provide you a summary of uh, what transpired at Huntsville Utilities because I know that uh, it was unprecedented in that we uh, implemented rolling blackouts in this community for the very first time. Indeed, it was the very first time in the 90s of the Tennessee Valley Authority that they called for such a thing. So uh, tonight I intend to provide a, a summary of the events, but I'm not going to enter into a, a discussion of long-term energy policy or what all this means or, or how we uh, keep this from ever happening in the future because there's a lot of reports and activities that are underway and that would be premature. But I did want to make sure that you understood what Huntsville Utility did, why we did, and uh, uh, then the steps we are taking at Huntsville Utilities uh, on the very practical, tactical level on the distribution system. So um, before I even get started, I do want to express my appreciation to the employees of Huntsville Utilities. Um, it is my great privilege uh, to work with them every day. They are very dedicated, very sharp men and women who do a lot of different jobs. But in this uh, situation, a lot of them were working during extremely cold weather. And uh, they were doing things, in some cases, they've never done before. So that was a stressful situation. I feel like they did a wonderful job, and I want to thank them for that work. Uh, in terms of uh, advance work before the storm hit, uh, we did know the cold weather was coming, so we did take uh, uh, precautions. Uh, we had additional crews ready to go, additional plant operators, we had contractors on call, and we had support teams from engineering, customer service, IT, et cetera, all that were, were prepped and ready, and we needed all of them. We ended up uh, pulling all of those levers, and so I'm glad that we did that work. We also made contact with our natural gas suppliers to make sure that the pipelines and all of our connections on the gas system uh, were in place, and that ended up being something we very much needed to do. We winterized uh, piping around our water treatment plants to make sure there was no uh, interruptions to flow, something else I'm very glad that we did because we very much needed to do that. And, of course, we did the things I'm sure everybody does when they know big weather's coming. You check your generators, you make sure you got your fuel, make sure you do your stuff. We took our trucks, put them inside, kept them warm, common sense stuff. And all of those things were worth doing. Sometimes you prepare and you wonder, is it worth the effort? This time it was worth the effort. We needed all of those steps to be made. So a uh, quick high-level summary. It is Winter Storm Elliot. That's the name of the storm, if you were wondering. that It does have a name. Um, and it really got started with us on Thursday night. High winds came through the area. We had a lot of customers that had power problems. Not a lot, but scattered outages throughout the service area. Uh, due to just high winds, normal high winds, like we had here this morning, as a matter of fact. The, the temperatures dropped quickly early Friday morning, that being December 23rd. Uh, the extreme cold brought record, uh, record high demands on our electric system, uh, and that created both some localized problems for HU and then more systemic problems for TVA uh, for our regional grid that we'll talk more about in a moment. Uh, matter of fact, HU first learned that there was um, insufficient uh, generation to meet the load around 9 a.m. on Friday morning. So um, um, that was, uh, I'll go through that in more detail as, as I go. Uh, we were in regular communication uh, with TVA after that <laughs> uh, throughout the events Friday and Saturday and then as things uh, got better in battle, then Chairman Strong and, and uh, uh, Mayor Finley as well. 
So uh, because again, rolling blackouts are not something we've done before, we were all learning as we went. So the impact of this storm was significant, but it did not create any critical challenges for HU despite the rolling blackouts, but that was really to address a TVA issue, not a Huntsville utility issue. So I'll, I'll go into that in more detail, but I wanted to just sort of level set here with some of these numbers uh, to make that clear. I mean, temperature drop from 27 to 3 degrees. 3 degrees is as low as we got here, according to our records. Um, and uh, uh, and the electric system more than doubled uh, within a few hours uh, on, it, on its load. So we're going to look at some graphs that explain that here in just a moment. I want to start with the water system because uh, there were stories across the state of Alabama and across the southeast and, and indeed uh, even the nation of, of cities, even good-sized cities like Huntsville, running out of water, not having water. We did not have that problem out of Huntsville, but it wasn't that we were unscathed. We did have concerns and issues, and I wanted to talk about that just so that you can understand the, the complexity of what we were dealing with, but we did not have anything that caused uh, uh, customer interruptions. So during that early cold winter, uh, uh, during that early cold event, the uh, water system, this is our pumping rate, the water system continued to pump pretty normally. You'll notice it reached really high levels later on Christmas Day. That's as things started to thaw. During the freeze, the sort of the, the problems were created, the, uh, the, the problems revealed themselves during the thaw. So we had um, about 260 calls come in uh, that our water crews went out and responded to during this period of time due to water mains breaking, um, but really pipes inside customer facilities. And uh, that created a tremendous drain on the water system. There was some talk about customers dripping pipes. Yes, you will see that, I mean, our load uh, was a little, uh, was higher than average for December, probably due to the dripping of pipes before. But the real problem started when the, when the pipes burst. Some of these broken pipes were caused at large commercial and industrial facilities that were impacted by the blackout. So this is how these things are related. The rolling blackout happens, power goes off. Your thermostat at home clicks back on, heat turns back on, everything's fine. Some uh, commercial and industrial facilities have more complicated HVAC systems. They may need to be rebooted. They may need to be touched in some way. There's a computer. Somebody needs to hit OK on a dialog box so that things can start back up. These rolling blackouts happened early in the morning on Saturday morning, Christmas Eve. No one was there to push those buttons. In some cases, that heat did not come back on. Those pipes froze then the thaw happened and significant amount of water flowed. So during this time period, we were pushing about as much water into our system as we do on a very hot, dry summer period, as though all the sprinklers in town were running. And so uh, it was enough that our, our crews could get the water pumped where it needed to be, but it did take focus uh, and uh, uh, more than a little bit of effort, especially on the north side of our system. That is where we started to see the, the drain and the issues. The fastest was keeping the tanks on the north side of the system filled. So, but I'm proud of the team. Uh, they kept that under control. And then as you see, the water level stayed high through the 26. And then as those problems got resolved, as those pipes got fixed, as the water got shut off, then things have returned back to normal. So. Again, just wanted to touch on the water system and that delayed impact, and unfortunately that does cause uh, damage in customer facilities, and um, uh, Huntsville City Schools and, and other places had serious impacts from that. Now I want to touch now on the gas system. Our gas, uh, uh, we set a new peak. So here is our gas flow on December 22nd, and then you can see the, the, the steady rise um, and this set a new peak demand on our natural gas system there in the early morning of December 23rd. And then uh, you can see it sort of uh, um, the mountaintop sort of scale away there uh, throughout the rest of the weekend. Uh, the gas system held together and worked as intended. Again, we worked with our pipeline folks. Um, we did set a new maximum flow on our system of 87,000 decatherms, if uh, anyone is uh, interested in the trivia. Gas crews had to respond to about 63 complaints from customers, but those were usually inside issues. My pilot lights out, I, have, I, I, I think I have a gas leak, et cetera. 
The only real struggle that our gas system had, aside from doing some fancy footwork to keep the flows right, was um, dealing with getting around when the ice hit on the, uh, what was that, the 26th. Uh, that complicated everybody's ability to respond to, to customer needs. So now I'm going to get the, to the electric side of things. Um, so this graph shows our electric loads. And you see down here, December 22nd, we're at about 685 uh, megawatts. And then it is quite a steep wall. Uh, this line here would be midnight between the 22nd and 23rd. Quite a steep climb here. This is about 9 o'clock uh, on, uh, excuse me, about 8 o'clock, I should say. I think 8, 9 o'clock, somewhere in that range on um, uh, the 23rd. And uh, we set a new peak demand of 1,475 megawatts. Um, so let me walk through uh, what this pink band means. This is when TVA sent out a call asking for us to implement what is known as Step 50 of the Emergency Load Curtailment Plan. Uh, all of the utilities in the Tennessee Valley are bound by the Emergency Load Curtailment Plan, and there are six steps. This was step the there's step 10, 20, 30, 40, and 50, and 60. The plan worked as intended. Uh, the actions taken uh, in these two steps allowed us to avoid step 60. You may say, what is step 60? Step 60 is when TVA just starts turning stuff off. We did not get to that. And that is to avoid the worst case scenario, which happens past step 60, where TVA loses control of the grid and it just, uh, it just starts shutting itself off. So all of this is actually a sign of success. The system worked as intended, but it is a blunt tool. So uh, let me walk you through what happened here specifically. On uh, Friday the 23rd, uh, TVA called for uh, a reduction of 5% of system load. Um, and let's see, that was at 9.30 a.m. until about 11.43 a.m. Uh, TVA had a problem with one of their large power plants, and then when they went to uh, get other generation to meet that need within the valley, a lot of those resources were not available, not functioning. They were bringing power in from outside the valley. That helped uh, them get through much of this rise. And then later in the morning, when the load started to fall, is when they had a problem. Why was that? Well, because as the weather event spread east, it impacted power systems outside of TVA, power systems that TVA was importing power from. When the weather got to them, they stopped that transmission of power to TVA. Completely normal, this is not a, a disastrous thing, and then TVA was short. And so thus the need to implement interruptions. So again, they had a loss of a power plant, understandable, that happens. Some generation wasn't available, and then uh, the importing of power was constrained due to uh, transmission operations. So in order to keep the system balanced, thus uh, the uh, call for ELCP Step 50. So HU on Friday morning, um, we implemented our voltage reduction system, which helps us drop our load. And we called our large industries and got them to shut down. We did not implement rolling blackouts on uh, Friday morning. Uh, that is technically not what the ELCP Step 50 calls for. Uh, there's reviews going on about that. Uh, HU will be participating in all those reviews. Uh, but we did not open breakers uh, on our substations on Friday. Uh, and as you can see, our load was in steady decline, but uh, technically we were not in compliance with ELCP Step 50 on Friday. And there are reasons for that, and we'll go through those reviews and, and uh, talk to the necessary people about that as, as those uh, reviews uh, are initiated. So now you see here, uh, it gets to be nightfall, the weather starts to uh, uh, get cold again, and we basically set another peak again here um, uh, uh, Friday night, and, uh, but TVA's generation was able to meet, this is our load, this is not TVA's load, TVA's load started to have problems here again in the morning on Saturday morning. So our load was lower, but TVA's load was higher. And then this sawtooth pattern you see here is where we are implementing our load reductions. So there you see visually the impact on our total system load and what that did to drop. 
initially TVA called for a 5% reduction. That call went out at 4.51 a.m. We were opening breakers at 4.56 a.m. So five minutes later, we were opening those breakers. And um, that 5% uh, reduction went to a 10% reduction at 5.12 a.m. And so HU implemented its reductions from 4.56 a.m. and then we completed them at 10.30 a.m. So that was the nature. And at the end, they went back from 10% to 5%. So we stepped back out of it. So HU implemented the mandatory reductions uh, through rolling blackouts, opening breakers on our 46 kV system. And uh, um, we're going to look at a map in just a minute, which shows the, the impact of that and which substations uh, were impacted and which customers were impacted. Most blackouts lasted 30 minutes. Uh, some lasted five minutes. A lot of that was tied to whether we were in a 5% curtailment or a 10% curtailment. And then I'll look at the map here in a minute to uh, show you the impact. Uh, when each of these things were done, um, here we go, there's the map. When each of these things were done, it impacted about 8,000 customers. So every time we opened a set of breakers in the rolling blackouts, it impacted about 8,000 customers at a time. So let me explain what's on this map. The green areas are all breakers that were operated as part of our ELCP 50 implementation. The red areas are breakers we did not operate because they housed critical infrastructure that we did not operate. Um, that included um, any hospital, it included water treatment plants, uh, it included the jail, it included air traffic control facilities, et cetera. So if you happen to live around one of those things, you got lucky. Uh, it's just that simple. Again, we implemented this through our 46 kV transmission system. We get power from TVA at 161 uh, transmission lines. Then most of our system is fed out through uh, stepping that down to 46 kV. And then the street lights, or the, excuse me, the power lines that run down your street are about 12 kV. And uh, by using the 46 system, we could implement this uh, very quickly and efficiently and had a good chance at the, uh, I know of one community that reported that when they uh, opened their breakers, uh, then when, they, when it came time to close them back in, 20% of them didn't close. And so I think that by using the 46 system, it helped us um, with that load pickup, which is a problem during cold weather events. You may wonder, well, what are the white areas? Those, were, those are areas that are not connected to our 46 system. Those are distribution circuits that go straight from 161 delivery points to 12 kV delivery points. They bypass the 46 system. We would have rotated them in as the situation got longer, but by the time we were ready to implement that, uh, the rolling blackouts had stopped. So, but as you can see, like this large area here, that is not a large population center. It's a large geographic area. It's not a large population center. And again, some of these are just the nature of the way the distribution system is built. Um, the shaded green areas were operated twice. The non-shaded green areas were operated once. What's the difference? It's just how it fell in the cycle and when TVA said to start and when TVA said to stop. So again, using the 46 kV system, we could open one breaker and shut down about four distribution substations at a time. If we had done it differently, and a matter of fact, we are currently rewriting the entire plan to do it differently, um, it is a bit more intensive. And since we were doing it for the first time, uh, we decided to use the 46 system because we could get the results that TVA needed quickly, efficiently, and at high probability of getting the load back on when, uh, when it was time to turn the load back on. <clears throat> so uh, I know this map is very important to you, and I can get you a larger version of this map for each council member so you can look at it more carefully. It is basically laid out the way that the, the distribution circuits lie is, is how things fell out. So um, in the midst of this, we're doing the rolling blackouts. Um, that made it very difficult for customers to call in. And honestly, during the rolling blackouts, it would have been very confusing to respond to customer outages anyway. But it took later in the afternoon on Saturday before our phone system issues were resolved, and then we could start working with customers and working through the issues uh, that resulted thereafter. So the next thing I want to show you 
is a bit of an analysis here on customers with electric heat versus customers with gas heat. We find this interesting to try to get an idea of how much of this peak was really set by that electric strip heat if you're a customer with a heat pump system that, you know, once the weather gets old, it switches to its auxiliary heat or its emergency heat, and therefore the strip heat kicks on, the resistant heat kicks on. So what you see here is this orange is uh, lo the load of our residential customers that are all electric. And you see their very sharp rise on December uh, 24th when this event occurred. This purple line is the load of all of our residential customers who have natural gas in their home, natural gas heating. We assume some of them may not have natural gas heating, by the way. So you see they do rise, maybe because they have space heaters or maybe because they have natural gas in their house, but it's not their furnace. You know, they may have natural gas in the house for their logs and their fireplace or maybe their stove, but they still have an electric furnace. So we still did see some rise there. But this, if a customer is all electric, this rise here, we've estimated that out about 600 megawatts. So we set that new peak of 1,400 megawatts. 600 of that was just residential heating for electric customers. So it's just interesting to see the impact. If you were a gas customer, you basically rolled through the event. Um, now, obviously, when the gas bill comes, you'll see that too. But uh, unfortunately, when that strip heat kicks on, it, uh, it does do, um, it draws a tremendous amount of energy. So now this is uh, my last slide, and it really lays out where are we going from here. <coughs> so there are several colors, and I'll walk you through uh, what each of them mean. Uh, the county has grown significantly since our last cold weather event. The last cold weather event was January 2nd, 2018. That's when we set our previous peak. This new peak is only 2% higher than that peak. But um, our system has grown probably around 15% uh, since then. So the new peak is only 2% higher, even though system growth has been much more than that. And part of the reason for that is because we've been building infrastructure along the way uh, to help keep up with that growth. So uh, since the last big freeze, HU has added 164 megawatts of additional distribution capacity. And that's been reflected in new substations built, <coughs> excuse me, on old Highway 431, uh, Redstone Gateway, uh, Ballpark, and uh, Stager, which is up, up here, and Hazel Green. So those are all new substations that have built since our last cold weather event in 2018. That's, a, that's a, a pretty quick pace of new construction. And you see where those green dots are, where those new substations are. By and large, there's no other colors around there. There's no other big problems around there. Now, that's not the case up here which gets us to a couple of other things. The next set I want to talk about are substations we have currently under construction. We have our Capshaw substation right here where we had significant problems. Uh, that station will be online within the next 30 days. I wish it had been online 30 days ago. But it will be online in 30 days. Then we have our uh, Old Monrovia substation and then the uh, uh, Burwell area, we're actually doing some uh, voltage circuit upgrades that will help carry more load in that area as well. So the clustering of these projects, this Capshaw station, I said, will be ready in the next 30 days. Old Monrovia and Birdwell, those should be ready around this summer. So within the next six months or so, <coughs> we should see uh, improvement in this area as well. So I think... We did have quite a bit of stress in this part of our system, separate and apart from rolling blackouts, separate and apart from TVA, just local HU issues. What you see here are these, this uh, gold color are circuits that were operating over 100% capacity, which is not necessarily a big problem in the middle of winter. When a circuit's running at 100% capacity, it means it's getting hot. Well, during the middle of winter, you don't really care if it's getting hot. You can do that for a while. Now, if circuit's at 100% capacity in August, that's a big problem because things are going to start to melt and shut down. So the gold are areas where we have load that we need to deal with, greater than 100% capacity. The orange is even worse. These are circuits that trip. They went out. The lights kept blinking. We kept having trouble keeping the power on in those areas due to uh, the load. <coughs> 
So now that takes us to, um, these are projects that are going to be completed within the year. These other purple areas are uh, ones that we're working on. Walker Lane up here, uh, Big Cove down here, um, Deposit up here, and then later Hobbs Road down here. These are substations we're currently planning. The Walker Lane, Big Cove, and Deposit is about, are they're about one to two years out, and the Hobbs Road area is, is further out than that, beyond, beyond one to two years. But what uh, the smart people behind me here are looking at is these are what we currently have in the pipeline, but we're reevaluating all of the prioritization of these after this event and taking advantage of the data that we've received from this. We're also looking to say, well, where did we have capacity issues that we don't have any projects planned? Now, you see that up here in sort of this um, almost sort of Ardmore area. That is, um, um, or towards Ardmore area. Um, each one of these uh, stars, by the way, are where we had a significant load interruption, and you see they're scattered all over the system. And we just had, um, and that, each one of these stars could be one customer, they could be 100 customers. <coughs> they're where we had tap, uh, tap load problems. So um, the team is looking at this very carefully right now. Um, a lot of the infrastructure that we put in in the last few years was very timely, helped us avoid a much more critical problem. We have substation constructions underway that are in the right places. We're building them where we need to build them. Matter of fact, this Big Cove improvement will actually help the systems in the north because it will allow us to shift some uh, subtransmission resources to the north. So even though that this system looks like it didn't have an, an area, its upgrade will help areas further north. As you can tell, overall, we had, uh, in terms of our distribution system, where we had problems, it was generally north of 72. That's where we have problems. But So um, on Friday, we had about 8,300 customers out. And on Saturday, we had about 7,800 customers out due to HU-specific issues separate from the rolling blackout. And to put that in perspective, we have about 210,000 electric customers. So uh, wrapping up, um, we have... Uh, completed the bulk of our after action review. Uh, we have a report that we're polishing up and we'll be giving to our board at its January meetings. Uh, we will be working with TVA as it fires up its after action reviews. TVA is conducting two types of reviews. One, a very thorough internal review led by TVA that includes local utility partners that are a part of that process. And then TVA is also starting an external blue ribbon panel made up of national experts that will evaluate TVA's uh, response <clears throat> and the need for the rolling blackout. So with that, I'll ask if there are any questions. Council members, do you have questions for Mr. Kelly? One, I'll just say, um, thank you, Madam President. One, I'll just say thank you for what I imagine everybody now understands. High level of intelligence may dumb down for us to understand. and. Um, <laughs> The perspectives of everybody who was here for, I know all of us have sent text during that time frame. Um, and I guess my one question, it seems to always come back to these things. Um, in consideration of these days, do you amount, and you, you sort of alluded to it. I know some people were worried about not turning on because they didn't know how it was going to affect the bill. Do you think that in this past time frame of this colder winter and moments, have you seen an issue or any anybody, individuals having issues with paying bills, an increase that is comparable or you know, for I imagine people who try to predict it, I'm one of those people. Um, have you seen any issues in that payment process and considerations of the SHARE program? Yes. Um, <clears throat> there is some blessing in that December was fairly mild before this event. Gotcha. So that helps moderate the bill a bit. But still, when, when your electric strip heat is on, right. you will get a big bill. There's no way to hide from that. We are looking... Uh, not looking, we are activating an expansion of the project share program Good. to increase the benefit and the opportunity uh, for those that qualify to uh, partake in it more than once through the, throughout this heating season. <laughs> so we are expanding that a, as a critical need right now. And then we're also looking more long-term at how do we expand the project share envelope? Not just how do we provide more need, but how do we provide more need to more people? So we have some programs going on at HU that the board has approved that are going to allow us to expand that program. 
and we'll be rolling that out this year. And, and the question came up, and again, I want to thank your office during this process for answering questions and, and my calls as well. Is there a bylaw or is there a contractual statement that says during times such as these, during a month, during a period, during a um, temperature, that utilities will not be shut off for that time frame or before yes. that situation? Can you state that? Yes. As a matter of fact, if the temperature is going to be below 32 degrees, okay. then Huntsville Utilities does not disconnect service for non-payment. And we will not disconnect service until the temperature is slated to be above 32 degrees. And we, and if it's only going to be above 32 degrees for like a day, we don't do that either. Gotcha. We 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 wait until the weather has warmed up. Gotcha. And there's also in the summer, I believe it's over 100 degrees. If the weather's going to be over it 100 is. degrees, we do not disconnect for non-payment. Again, I can't thank you for the issue that I had and the individual that you all helped. I was not aware of that. I know I had heard of it, but thank you for giving that clarity. Thank you, Mr. President. Are there any other council members? Mr. Kling. I know what y'all were doing as far as rolling blackouts to uh, to uh, protect the system and make sure that, you know, power was available. Have y'all had any complaints, concerns? Uh, I think I had a couple that I didn't know if they were related to y'all also about um, the, pow the problems when a power's off and then there's that power surge that comes on or is there... Anything that y'all can do to minimize a surge when it comes on, powers off, and then whammo, it comes back on again. Sometimes uh, appliances and uh, equipment can be damaged. That, that does happen from time to time. Uh, in this sort of event, I would have expected less of that because our voltages were, were we, we weren't like spicing up the system, so to speak. It, we were working to just keep it working. So, um, it, we do receive information from customers that, you know, my whatever broke and isn't working. Um, uh, and we'll talk to customers in those instances, but often there's not a whole lot we can do. Um, Mike Counts is here, and, and he may have a, a smarter thing to say, but uh, uh, overall, the you know, when we put those breakers in, there's usually not a surge per se on our system. Now, whether or not that impacts how it plays out in an individual customer's home, I can't really say. I have a question. Yep, Mr. Uh, Mr. Mr. Kelly, can you explain the difference when it's 100 degrees and when it's three degrees, the difference in load, mm -hmm. if that makes sense? Like, why don't we have rolling blackouts when it's 100 degrees? Mm. Well, it's because um, we can open our windows <laughs> and sit in the shade. I mean, is it that simple? Uh, that does help. Um, what has proven to be an interesting challenge for this region in the last 10 to 15 years has been extreme cold, not so much extreme heat. You're right, people can sweat a little bit. Um, you'd probably have to go back to the, uh, what was it, 2001, yeah, August 2001 Northeast blackout that took out the whole Northeast U.S. to really think of a large summer outage. But one thing that's happening is everything's becoming more energy efficient and everything is becoming smarter, and that's good overall, and that, that's, that's progress. But what that means is that the valleys are getting lower and the peaks are getting higher. And what I mean by that is when I show you graphs like that that show usage, um, we are using less power on a day-to-day -day basis because of smart energy efficiency things, and if you don't need it, you don't use it. But when you do need it, it fires up. But that increases the peaks for instantaneous loads. So uh, what that means is things are all energy efficient, you're not using it, it's real low, and then all of a sudden all the electrical devices, all the electric heat, all of that turns on very quickly. And that puts a pretty, start, a pretty sharp spike on the system. It's very hard for, for any utility, uh, be it TVA, Huntsville Utilities, et cetera, to manage those spikes sometimes. Uh, you have to decide, are you buying generation to meet the spike, or are you buying generation for the valley, or somewhere in the middle, and where do you want to land on that? So um, I think the nature of the improvements and appliances and technology that we're putting in the home, uh, I think, is creating more instantaneous power draws, and that may be driving our, our demand a little bit higher. But there's a lot of research that, due to this event, because it did not just affect the TVA area, it also affected Duke's power system, it also affected PGM's power system. So this was a large event that affected really the eastern United States. 
um, there's a lot of research that's going to go on to the analysis of why did this happen? Why were the why were multiple regional power systems impacted the way they were in this event? I think we'll learn more about that. Questions just like you asked. And I will just end by saying that I attended a meeting this morning um, where Mr. Gertis presented, uh, and one of the things we talked about was utility assistance for people who are going to have some challenges um, paying those those higher bills as they come. And hopefully it's mediated by that milder weather in December. Um, but it's good to know that we have a community that is willing to step up and in the gap and help, uh, whether it's through Project Share or through Catholic Center for Concern or Community Action or any of these other organizations that are, that are helping, that help is available. Thank you very much for your presentation, and thanks to everybody who was part of putting this together. You have a great team working with you, and we appreciate it. Yes, ma'am.